Hey there and welcome back! Today we are diving into an important topic that can make or break your data analysis, the t-test. Or more precisely, when you should stop using a t-test. We discuss three cases when you should definitely not use the t-test. But first of all, what is the t-test? The t-test is a statistical test procedure. Hmm, and what does the t-test do? The t-test analyzes whether there is a significant difference between the means of two groups. For example, the two groups may consist of patients where one group received drug A and the other group received drug B. We now want to determine if there is a difference in blood pressure between these two groups. Now there are three different types of t-tests. The one-sample t-test, the independent samples t-test and the paired samples t-test. When do we use the one-sample t-test? We use the one-sample t-test when we want to compare the mean of a sample with a known reference mean. The null hypothesis in the one-sample t-test is the sample mean is equal to the given reference value. So it assumes that there is no difference. And the alternative hypothesis is the sample mean is not equal to the given reference value. An example. A chocolate bar manufacturer claims that its chocolate bars weigh an average of 50 grams. To check this, we take a sample of 30 bars and weigh them. The mean value of this sample is 48 grams. Now we can use a one sample t-test to check if the mean of 48 grams is significantly different from the claimed 50 grams. When do we use the independent samples t-test? We use the t-test for independent samples when we want to compare the means of two independent groups or samples. We want to know if there is a significant difference between these means. The null hypothesis in the independent t-test is the mean values in both groups are the same. So there is no difference between the two groups. And the alternative hypothesis is the mean values in both groups are not the same. So there is a difference between the two groups. An example. We would like to compare the effectiveness of two painkillers. We randomly divide 60 people into two groups. The first group receives drug A and the second group receives drug B. Using an independent t-test, we can now test whether there is a significant difference in pain relief between the two drugs. When do we use the paired samples t-test? We use the paired samples t-test to compare the means of two dependent groups. In the paired t-test, the null hypothesis is the mean of the difference between the pairs is zero and the alternative hypothesis is the mean of the difference between the pairs is unequal to zero. Let's look at an example. We want to know how effective a diet is. To do this, we weigh 30 people before the diet and then weigh exactly the same people after the diet. Now we can look at the difference in weight before and after for each subject. We can now use a paired samples t-test to test whether there is a significant difference. If you want to know more about the t-test, take a look at our book Statistics Made Easy. Alright, fine. But when should we not use a t-test? Here are three situations where you should never use a t-test. The first point, of course, the most obvious one is that the assumptions for a t-test must be met. Otherwise, the results may be biased. What are the assumptions for a t-test? Of course, we first need a suitable sample. In the one sample t-test, we need a sample and a reference value. In the independent t-test, we need two independent samples. In the case of a paired t-test, a paired sample. The variable for which we want to test whether there is a difference between the means must be metric. Examples of metric are age, weight and income. 
a person's level of education is, nor the metric variable. In addition, the metric variable must be normally distributed in all three test variants. To learn how to test if your data is normally distributed, watch my video Test for Normal Distribution. If your data are not normally distributed, use a non-parametric test such as the Man whitney u test or the Wilcoxon test. You can find out more about these tests in our book or in our YouTube videos of these tests. In case of an independent t-test, the variances in two groups must still be approximately equal. You can check whether the variances are equal using Levine's test. Let's move on to point two. In my opinion, this point is violated the most. Let's call it wrong research process. What do I mean by research process? Simply put, when you want to test a hypothesis, you start by formulating a null hypothesis. To determine whether you should reject this hypothesis, you collect data and evaluate it using a hypothesis test. The hypothesis test provides a p-value. The p-value indicates whether the mean values differ significantly from each other and helps you decide whether to reject the null hypothesis. However, for many researchers, achieving a significant p-value has become the ultimate goal, driven by the high pressure to obtain and publish significant results. As a result, the entire research process is often turned upside down. A lot of data is simply collected, now the data is taken and hypothesis tests are calculated with all possible combinations. Finally, it is simply checked whether any of the hypothesis tests have produced a significant result. Hmm, but something is missing, right? Exactly, the hypothesis. The hypothesis is then simply formulated afterwards. However, this is of course a completely invalid approach. Why is that wrong? Let's say we use a significance level of 5%. This means that if we have a p-value of less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and we speak of a significant result. However, a significance level of 0.05 means that in 5% of cases we reject the null hypothesis even though the null hypothesis is actually true. So we are making a mistake or making an error. In other words, if we do 20 tests and in reality there is no difference in any of them, on average we can expect to get one significant result by chance. This is also called p-hacking and it is not the way to go. So again, hypothesis testing is intended to be a process where you start with a clear hypothesis based on theory or prior research and then test it with your data. By reversing this process, you undermine the scientific rigor and reduce the validity of your findings. What is the third case where a t-test should never be used? The third point is never use a classical t-test when testing for equivalence or non-inferiority. Let's look at an example. Suppose you've developed a new drug that has fewer side effects than the standard treatment. Rather than simply determining whether there is a significant difference between the old and the new drug, your goal is to assess whether the two treatments produce statistically similar effects within a predefined margin of equivalence. The aim is to show that the new treatment's effect is neither significantly worse nor significantly better than the standard treatment, but falls within an acceptable range. In this scenario, you would use an equivalence test. We could of course go one step further and say, okay, if the new drug performs even better, that's fine with me, it just shouldn't perform considerably worse. Then our aim is to demonstrate that the new treatment is not significantly worse than the existing treatment by more than a specified margin. In this case, a non-inferiority test would be appropriate.
Both the equivalence test and the non-inferiority test share similarities to the t-test, but you cannot simply use a normal t-test to answer these questions. If you want to know more about equivalence and non-inferiority tests, just subscribe to our channel, there will certainly be a separate video coming soon. For sure you can calculate equivalence and non-inferiority tests as well as t-tests online with DataTab. To do this, simply copy your data into this table. Let's say you want to know if there is significant difference between drug A and drug B with respect to a particular outcome, for example, reduction in blood pressure. If you simply click on the two variables, DataDev will automatically calculate a t-test for you. If you don't know exactly how to interpret the individual results, you can simply click on AI interpretation next to the individual tables. Alternatively, you can also get a summary of the results in words. Here you can check the assumptions. If these are not fulfilled, you can also calculate the non-parametric counterpart, the Mann-Whitney U-Test. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video.